this story before, but maybe not all of you have heard it, and that's one of the pitfalls of being a pastor is that you tell stories over and over again. Um, but when we were, well, when I was in college, um, you know, I was on fire for God, for Jesus, and wanted to do anything that Jesus wanted me to do. And um, so what I basically prayed to God is, God, I will go anywhere you want me to go except for Africa. And, you know, just, it was, it's hot there. It's big. Um, it seemed a little bit wild to me. And um, for some reason, I just didn't want to go there. And so when I, uh, when I went there in 1997, uh, God sent me on a mission trip with my, with my school, with my college. And it was a great experience to, to go there and be there. It was difficult. It was hard, but it was really good in the, in the same way. Well, a few months after that, Carrie and I got married in 1997, and as newlyweds, one of the things that we kind of looked at each other and agreed on was like, we will go anywhere that God sends us except for Los Angeles. <laughs> and part of that was, you know, we had our, our pastor friend who moved down there and he asked, actually asked me to accept a job as a junior high pastor, and I said no. And then a few months later, he called me back, and uh, less than five months after we were married, guess where we were? We were moving into an apartment in La Habra, California, right in the middle of the L.A. basin with 13 million of our best friends. And we spent seven and a half amazing years down there. We loved it. We were like half an hour away from Disneyland. We had two kids down there. I was able to go to seminary. And it was just a great experience. Well, we moved up to the Northwest and, and back up to the Northwest in 2005. And then a, a couple of years later, we were in the Seattle area. And we kind of looked at each other and said, we'd love to go back to Central Oregon, but there's no way we're moving to Prineville. And landing there, and here's where we've been now for the last 15 or so years in Prineville, Oregon, our hometown. Um, it was surprising to us. And sometimes, you know, you put things in front of God and you say, um, this is what I want, this is the way I'd like it to be, and then God answers your prayer by giving you exactly what you don't want. He often puts us in places that we never would have chosen uh, and we never would have asked for them. We have some friends uh, who have five kids, and their oldest son, he's in his early 20s, um, he was born with Down syndrome. And nobody ever, I don't think, maybe people do, but I don't know anybody that prays that their children would be born uh, with some kind of disability. And so it was a surprise to them, it was a shock to them, but um, they held on to their faith in God through that, and they actually began a ministry where they uh, go around the world and they encourage and train parents and families with, who have kids with disabilities. And they equip churches to minister with family, to families who have kids with disabilities. And they actually now serve in the Ukraine for this ministry that they began um, to be able to bless um, the church and these families. And they're just an amazing family. It's one of those things, again, where um, God gives us not what we want all the time, but what he wants for us. He gives us not always what we ask for, but he always gives us what's best for us. And so often that does not look like what we imagined. It doesn't always look like the dream that we set out for our lives when we began. It all often looks very much different and often very difficult. Sometimes it makes us, too, in that sense, doubt God's ability. Sometimes it, it makes us doubt God's plan for us or, or makes us doubt his presence in our lives. And if you'll uh, excuse me, once again, we're having technical difficulties. If you can believe it, I know it's a hard one to believe. I've got to, hey. I know, I've, I'm going to try to run it from up here though, son. Watch this conversation here. See if we can do it. Got it. Thank you, Caleb. Good job. All right. So here we are. We're with Jesus now in the desert out in the wilderness, out in, in the place that we often don't want to go. We read in this passage, uh, Jesus has just been baptized, and on the heels of his baptism, he goes out into the wilderness. And it, it says that Jesus was led up by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. He was hungry. 
And what this text makes clear, look at it carefully, what it makes clear is that what was happening here was a God-designed purpose. Who led him into the desert? It wasn't the devil, it was the Spirit, it was the Holy Spirit who had just descended on him in his baptism is the one leading him out there, and he's leading him out there for this purpose, to be tempted by the devil. Now last week we, we noticed that Jesus is the new and better Israel. That, that like Israel, he was God's son who was brought out of Egypt. We saw that in Matthew chapter 2. And then like Israel, who, who miraculously passed through the Red Sea as they came out of Egypt, Jesus in chapter 3 passes through the waters of baptism. And now in chapter 4, like Israel, Jesus is led into the wilderness. And as we'll see throughout this morning, where Israel failed in the wilderness, Jesus kept his father's commands Perfectly. Jesus is the new and the better Israel. And we even see in, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, the divine intentionality when Israel was brought into the desert. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Who led them into the wilderness? The Lord led them into the wilderness to test them. Now you might consider, if you would, keeping one finger in Deuteronomy chapter 6 through 8 this morning and the other finger in Matthew chapter 4 because Jesus, when he responds to the devil in these temptations, he quotes from the Old Testament and he quotes exclusively from two chapters, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Deuteronomy chapter 8. It's convenient that Deuteronomy 7 falls in between those, so 6 through 8 is where you want to keep your, keep your finger because he's intentionally responding and retelling the story, the Exodus story. Because that's what Deuteronomy 6 and eight, six through 8 is. It's Moses with his last speech, his last address to the people of Israel before he goes up on the mountain and dies. And the people are preparing to go into the promised land and God is recounting their story, recounting his faithfulness, recounting their unfaithfulness and warning them and telling them this is how you must live when you go into the land. And these three chapters provide really a framework for understanding Jesus' temptation, or as I've called it this morning, the duel with the, with the devil in the desert. And here we have a duel. It's in the desert or the wilderness. And the desert or the wilderness is a rough empty, dry, barren place. It's desolate, it's uninhabited, it's lonely, it's inhospitable and, and uncivilized. And sometimes a desert or a wilderness does not necessarily need to be a place. Sometimes it's a time or a season of difficulty and testing in life. We all go through deserts in our life. We all go through wilderness times. In the 16th century, there was a Spanish priest named St. John of the Cross, and he called these times the dark night of the soul. And I don't have to explain that phrase, because you get it. Many of you have been through a dark night of the soul. Many of you have been through a wilderness time. We've experienced these things, these desert wilderness times firsthand. We must all take our turns in facing our own, our own God-designed duels in the desert with the devil. And I don't know if you, you can imagine an old west town, it's a gunfight, right? And you've got the devil, the villain on the one side, the, the opponent who is the devil. He's also in verse 3 called the tempter. Jesus himself, in verse 10, calls him Satan. We know that this is God's ancient enemy, who's a created being. He's not divine. He's created. He's a fallen angel. He's a personal being who's a liar and a thief. And in this story, the devil has awaited his opportunity. He's, he's awaited for Jesus to be vulnerable. And now Jesus has, has wandered in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights without food. Has anyone in here ever fasted for 40 days and 40 nights? Painful. Okay, your body begins to eat itself. That's what happens. It's, it's painful. You're hungry. You're weak. 
And now the, des- the, the devil comes at Jesus' most vulnerable, like he comes at us. When we're most vulnerable, when we're most f- fatigued, when we are at often the brink. So on the one hand, we have the villain, the devil. On the other side, we have the hero who is the son. We've already heard at the end of chapter three, a voice from heaven, God's voice, declare, this is my son, my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And so right off the bat in this temptation, the tempter dares Jesus to prove it. Verse three, if, if you are the son of God. Verse six, second temptation, if you are the son of God, then... Now Israel too, as we go back to Deuteronomy, Israel too was God's son, was special to him. So Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse six, they were, Moses says, a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, Israel was God's beloved son. And in chapter eight, Moses will say, like a son, he disciplined you like he was your father. And Israel failed as a son when they forgot their status as son. Sometimes they they took their status for granted, and the same can be said for you and me. Oftentimes we forget who we are. We forget that we're Jesus's, or that we're God the Father's sons and daughters, Jesus's brothers and sisters. But as the new and better Israel, Jesus did not forget who he was. He did not take his sonship for granted. He does what neither Israel nor you nor I were able to do on our own. So here we have it set up in the desert. Here's a duel between the villain, the devil, and the hero, the son. And the first temptation is this, verse three. The tempter came to him and said to him, If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So we're going to look at each of these temptations by looking at the backstory, first of all. And we'll go back to Deuteronomy, which reminds us of how parallel Jesus' story and Israel's are. And in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, It says that God humbled you and let you hunger. And we know from the story, from the story of Israel, that when they hungered, what did they do? They grumbled, right? They they complained. Because in their minds and in our minds, why would a good God let me suffer? Why would a good God allow me to go without food or or to go hungry? And so here's what takes place. The story actually is told in Exodus chapter 16. It says, The whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now, most of us have never known the kind of hunger that will cause people to do unthinkable things to feed themselves. And here, hunger drives Israel to complain. It drives them to, to grumble. It drives them to demand things of God. It, called, it, it caused them to call into question God's good intentions for them. And, and hunger actually drew them to turn to whatever could provide food for them. And so Israel was basically saying, Our hunger, because we're hungry, because we have these pains, because God hasn't provided for us and filled our bellies up, this must be evidence that God has abandoned us. My suffering means that God has abandoned us. He doesn't care for me anymore. Do you guys remember when we were in Egypt? We had, at least we had food there, right? We might have been slaves, but at least we had food. And so in the end, what Israel is saying, it's better to be in slavery than to be hungry. It's better to be enslaved than to suffer. And the fulfillment of what Israel should have been, we find in Jesus. Jesus. 
And we have to understand that backstory to help us to know what Jesus was actually being tempted with here. Right, he was facing the physical suffering of 40 days without food. And he would, he would eventually, in his ministry three and a half years later, he would eventually face the suffering of the, of the cross. And so the temptation here for Jesus was to cut his suffering short. Like Israel wanted to cut their suffering short. They wanted to fill their bellies. And Jesus here is being tempted to preemptively find relief through a premature deliverance. Now, could Jesus have turned rocks into bread? Yeah, it wouldn't have been a temptation if he couldn't have done it. Right? He could have turned rocks into bread. He could have fed himself. If we look at that and go like, well, it doesn't seem like it's wrong. It seems like a sensible thing to do. If I could do it, I probably would. But three and a half years later, as he hangs on a cross, he tells the Roman governor, Pilate, I've got legions of angels at my beck and call, and if I want to call them to deliver me, I can. And what did he do? He hung on a cross to pay for our sins. He did not cut his suffering short or preemptively seek a premature deliverance. See, God's plan for Jesus was perfect obedience to his will, no matter how difficult, no matter how excruciating it might, might be. And surprisingly, the crazy thing is that, that Jesus says that this very obedience itself was like food. John chapter 4, verse 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. To obey God to Jesus was like food. Now in response to the tempter, Jesus draws us back to the Exodus story. He draws us back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. And this is what he quotes. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 where it says, He humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. See, the shocking part in this story to us is that God would let them suffer, that God would let them hunger, but there was a purpose in their hunger. There was a purpose in their pain. There's a purpose in our hunger. There's a purpose when when our souls feel empty. It's to teach us that our life does not consist in food or physical things. Our life consists in hearing and obeying God's word. So Exodus chapter 16, 4, to continue that story, the Lord says to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you. We know that's manna. And the people shall go, shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. It was important to God that his people obey him. But what his people said was this. It's better to be in slavery than to be hungry. And what Jesus said was, it's better to die of hunger than to disobey God. So the temptation for Jesus had to do with obedience and trust. Would Jesus trust his father's plan? Would he trust his father's provision in the face of unbearable suffering? Or will he take take things into his own hands, create bread out of stones, call angels to deliver him, and prematurely use his power to serve himself and end his suffering? But what about for us? What about for you and me? What, how many times, I think, do we take things into our own hands to alleviate our own suffering? How often do we grumble when the, when the pain of our circumstances tempts us to think that God has abandoned us or he doesn't care for us anymore? But it's a reminder, too, that sometimes God lets us go hungry. Sometimes God lets us suffer Not for the sake of suffering, but so that we can know that we do not live by bread alone. There's much more to our lives than food and clothing and shelter and money and all the things we give so much attention to that in fact hearing and doing God's word should be a kind of nourishment to us. It should should feed our souls. And at the core of doing God's will 
is radically depending upon him for our provision. And he has provided, brothers and sisters, the perfect food for us. Because Jesus said in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. The second temptation is this. We find it in chapter 4, verses 5 to 7, where the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And the the devil uses God's own word now to tempt the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now in this exchange, Jesus is quoting here from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. And I'll give you the whole verse here. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, comma, as you tested him at Massa. And this is, a, this is a reference to an event that's recorded in Exodus 6, 17 at a place called Massa. And Massa in Hebrew means testing. The other name for the place is Meribah, which means quarreling. And it was here that the Israelites didn't come up against their hunger like they did in Exodus 16, but now it's their thirst. It says in Exodus 17, 1 and 2, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? And then verse 7 says this, he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Not. And and the scriptures repeatedly connect this event with testing God. So the psalm that Melissa read earlier, Psalm 95, reminds them of this very event. It says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. In fact, if you go to the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 are really an extended meditation on this story of Exodus 17 and of Psalm 95. And according to Psalm 95, the people of Israel are doing the very thing, did the very thing that their enemy Pharaoh had done, hardening their hearts towards God. So that they had seen all the miraculous work that God had performed in Egypt. They had seen the plagues. They had had crossed through the sea on dry land. But for some reason, that was not enough for God to prove himself to them. So they were quarreling with God. Is God really with us? God, we think we have a better plan here. Now, the author to the Hebrews calls their behavior unbelief and disobedience. But we see the the fulfillment of what Israel should have been again in Jesus. And this is the background story. Remember, this is the story he has in mind as he stands at the highest point of the temple looking down. And the first temptation was was to cut his suffering short by taking things into his own hands. And this temptation pushes that just a little bit further and asking him, tempting him, testing him by trying to get him to make God prove himself by forcing his hand. We can imagine the devil saying, because really Jesus, if you are the son of God and if the father really loves you so much, you can't suffer until it's your time. There's no way he's going to let you die if you fall off of this. So make him prove it. Force him to deliver you dramatically so that you know he's with you. Because he sure doesn't seem like he's with you out here in the wilderness. But to give in to this temptation, Jesus' heart would have had to be hard against his father. But thankfully, (laughs) Jesus' heart was not hard. It was soft toward his father. He had no intention of deviating from God's plan. He had no doubt 
of God's presence with him. He had no quarrel with his father and no need to test him. And for you and I, for you and me, we are all too familiar with questioning and challenging God's perfect plan for us. And when it doesn't go our way, how often do we we shake our fists at heaven? Or or we plead and and try to make deals with God to to force his hand and, and deliver us or do what we want him to. And when we try to force his hand, he seldom responds. And then what do we do in turn? Slowly we begin to harden our hearts. And we turn away from him and we say, well, I don't know that he's really real. He didn't do what I thought he should do. We, we begin to doubt his, his presence with us. We begin to turn away from faith and press towards unbelief. And this is a core danger for us is, is unbelief. But, but our call, brothers and sisters, our call is to keep our hearts soft towards God despite the circumstances. And God graciously provides in his own way, in his own time, just as he did at Massa. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So despite their thirst, despite their quarreling, despite their testing, God still provided water miraculously from the rock for us. And God will always provide for us, not always in the ways that we want. The third temptation takes place in verses 8 to 10, and it says, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And this temptation just seems too obvious. You know, like, really? That's what you're going to ask for? You're going to ask for idolatry? That's like straight up? You know, so, so it's, there's something else going on in the background here. And I think what this temptation offers is a trade-off. And the trade-off is allegiance for allegiance. And, and the devil, I think, could think of no greater thing himself than having power. Having the allegiance of millions, even billions, under him. In Paradise Lost, the the famous poem by John Milton, the Satan character famously said, it's better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven. This is what Satan wants is, is rulership. And he was willing to trade all of that. He was willing to exchange the allegiance of the nations for the allegiance of one person, the Son of God himself. Now, when we go back to look at Israel, we see that the very moment when Israel was swearing their allegiance to Yahweh was the the very moment when they were tested to give their allegiance or tempted to give their allegiance to other gods. So they're at the base of Mount Sinai. Moses is up on the mountain and he's been up there 40 days and 40 nights. And they don't know where he's at. So they come to Moses' brother Aaron and they say, get up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of them. And Aaron gives in to their request. Aaron says, okay, bring, bring me all your gold, bring me all your jewelry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to craft a golden calf out of it. And this is the God who brought us out of Israel. And remember, remember the people of Israel rose up to eat and drink and, and to play. Sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. For Israel, the trade-off for them was allegiance to Yahweh on one hand. Or allegiance, trading that for gods who would give them what they wanted. Gods who who promised to fulfill all of their desires. And this really is the essence of idolatry. And this would be Israel's constant struggle and failure throughout the years. And so Moses reminded them 40 years later in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and this is where Jesus quotes from, in, uh, in his duel with the, with the devil, Deuteronomy 6, 13 to 15, it is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him alone you shall serve or worship. And by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God. 
lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. So, so in the end, the trade-off is never a win-win. If you want to trade off allegiances, in the end, you might get something you want, but, but you're going you're gonna to lose. Turning to gods who give you what you want will always come with consequences. Now, for Jesus, the temptation was, was to trade the instant allegiance of all the kingdoms of the world for his own allegiance to his enemy, the devil. And then, thankfully, Jesus saw through the ploy Because he would never give his allegiance to anyone but his father. And and he knew that through his own suffering, here's the thing. He he, he could look on the nations of the world and instantly have them bow down to him. Or through his suffering, he could eventually win the allegiance of the nations. And we know that three and a half years later, after his crucifixion, after his burial, after he rose again, he stood on a high mountain in Galilee with 11 of his disciples. And he said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus will save and and get the allegiance of of people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. In heaven, we will all gather around him and the nations will bow down to him. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, but it will only come through his suffering and his allegiance and his devotion to his Father. Now, oftentimes we're less like Jesus and more like Israel too willing to trade our allegiance for for an opportunity to have everything that our hearts desire. So we pursue the gods of comfort or or, or the gods of pleasure or the gods of security or the gods of prosperity or the gods of consumerism or the gods of entertainment who constantly beckon us with fancy things to attract our attention and appeal to the desires of our heart. Our our idolatry may be more subtle than bowing down to a golden calf, but it's just as real and it's equally as dangerous. Now, I've attempted this morning, as we've gone through these three temptations of Jesus, to, to try to make application to us throughout. And so we all have to wrestle in our own hearts with, with how we respond or how we would respond when, when brought, with this, brought the same temptations from the evil one. But allow me to make four separate points of application in closing this morning. And the first is this. The first is that we all have desert times. These are times in our lives of testing, of temptation. They're times of difficulty. They're times of pressure when maybe we feel like we're in a vice. And in his wisdom, God puts us in deserts. Maybe like a worldwide pandemic. And why does he do that? He does that to test us. He does that to to see if we will lean into him or look elsewhere for comfort or or help or, or salvation. But a desert never means that God has abandoned you or angry with you because not only does he, he do it to test you, he does it to temper you. He, he does it to, to shape you and form you to be like his son, Jesus, who walked through every temptation just like we have but was without sin. When desert times come into your lives, this often means that he loves you and is working on you because he wants you to be like Jesus. If he didn't love you, he'd just let you do whatever you wanted to. We all have desert times. And secondly, if you belong to Jesus, you are a son or a daughter of God. If you put your faith in Christ if you follow him and if you've given him your allegiance, what I want to remind you of, brothers and sisters, is not to doubt this reality and not to allow anyone to tell you differently because there are literally millions of people who want to tell you who you are and there's only one person who gets to tell you who you are. So this morning, labor to know who you are by laboring to know whose you are. 
who you belong to. Act on the knowledge. Live in the knowledge that God loves you and God delights in you. And your trust in this reality should drive your obedience, not the other way around. We don't obey so that God will be pleased with us. We obey because God is pleased with us. The third thing is know the word. Jesus knew the scriptures inside and out. He knew them well enough to mount a defense against the the devil's deceits and temptations. The question for all of us is, do you know the word well enough to resist the temptation when it comes? Fourthly and finally, let me encourage you this morning to look at Jesus because where we fail and we will fail, Jesus stands firm. He is our perfect stand-in. He is the rock of our salvation. He is our great high priest. And because he stands in our place, that, that means everything. So we can look to him for mercy and grace. We can look to him for, for strength and help. We can trust that even when we fail, he will never fail us. And as Jesus at the end of this story receives care from the angels, we can look to him to receive the same kind of help. And this is Hebrews chapter four, verses 15 and 16. One of my favorite couple of verses in the Bible. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray. Jesus, we are impressed with you once again. And my prayer this morning is that our our eyes would be on you to tell us who we are, to tell us whose we are, and to know that even though we fail, God, Jesus succeeds. Even though we are weak, he is strong. Even though we are needy, he needs nothing. And we can look at this account of his duel with the devil in the desert and know not only that he overcame for us, but he will also strengthen us in our temptations. God, whatever situation we find ourselves in today, whatever heat of battle or whatever vice or knot hole we feel like we're being pulled through this morning, God, would you show us that you are present with us in that that you are our strength and our provider, that you are our great high priest, Jesus. We look to you this morning. May you get all the glory. In your name we pray, amen.